Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I have the pleasure of uh, finishing off the, this particular track with what I've termed some open street map futures. And the slightly convoluted title is because I believe there are many possible futures. Some, of, some things from some of these futures may happen, and many of them won't. My background in OpenStreetMap is that I've been involved in development for many years. Um, I've attended lots of hack weekends. I've done lots of development myself. I've worked on different projects and worked with different companies on different projects. So if I'm here to talk about the future of OpenStreetMap, I'm going to limit myself to talking about the development features and the development futures. So there's plenty more to OpenStreetMap than I'm going to cover today, um, but this is going to focus on the, on the technical side. Uh, there's a variously misattributed quote, often to Niels Bohr, but he didn't say it, saying, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. So bear that in mind. And also, it would be great to stand up and say, this is the roadmap for OpenStreetMap. This is what we're going to do. And there isn't a roadmap. Um, the other spoiler is there isn't even a secret roadmap. I don't have one that we haven't shared yet. There's, there just really isn't a roadmap. Um, much as I would like there to be. There's also questions on, is there even a team to do the future of OpenStreetMap? But we'll come back to that later. The final thing is if I stand up here and say it's a good idea, not necessarily everybody will believe me, as you can tell from the slightly pointed body language when uh, I've previously been discussing my great ideas. So, <laughs> given all of the above, is that enough caveats about what I'm going to say? Great. Within OpenStreetMap, I divide OpenStreetMap development into three distinct categories. Those are the categories around getting the data in, which covers a lot of community topics, things like editors, how we basically collect data from the world and put it into OpenStreetMap. Whilst the data is within OpenStreetMap, there are many processes that happen, many technologies that are involved. And then we spit OpenStreetMap data out at the far end, usually through planet dumps and other technical ways of distributing the data. And these get used in lots of different ways. I'm not going to discuss the using OpenStreetMap data, because you'll have all been in many different talks by many people better qualified to talk about cool ways to use OpenStreetMap. I want to focus on some areas which are often less discussed, the kind of things which I think of as core OpenStreetMap technologies, core OpenStreetMap processes. And so the, the discussion today will be looking at um, aspects of what's happening around the processes of getting the data into OpenStreetMap and how we manage it within OpenStreetMap itself. I'm first going to talk about a couple of projects which are actually happening now, but that might not have much visibility um, outside of uh, a few developers. So these are things which are already in progress. The first one is around the, the main structure of how we manage the um, data within OpenStreetMap, how, we, how the API works. Um, we have the, the OpenStreetMap website project, which is on the left-hand side. It takes incoming requests from the front-end machines, does some user authentication. It's responsible for all different parts of OpenStreetMap, whether that's the editing API, storing GPX traces, the diaries, the friends, the chain set comments, all these kind of things are all bundled up into this one application. But anybody who's ever written a Ruby on Rails application which can generate XML documents with 20,000 elements inside will realize very quickly this is not a great way of doing it, um, as we did many years ago. And so we spun this out into a separate program called CGI Map, which runs independently of the rest of the software um, and processes some of the API calls. And they both, both sets of software talk to the same database. This isn't ideal. It's not the best way of doing it. Uh, for example, if you grab your own copy of the OpenStreetMap website and run it, we don't use that code. We use some special other code. So what I was working on at the moment is a project called CGI Map Ruby. Uh, which Matt Amos is working on, which is to take the CGI map aspect, it's written in C++, so it's very fast, but to write a, a Ruby wrapper around that C++ code and embed it within the, the main part of the website. It will cut down on code duplication, 
Um, it means that everybody gets this fast running XML processing for free. And we can move more of the API over onto a C -backed, um, C++ backed software and things will just run faster. This is a lot of interesting work, um, but it's very behind the scenes work. There's, I, I don't have any good graphics or anything else to show you about this. Um, so you have to use your imagination. But it's these core technologies that um, I find very interesting. The second thing which is happening now is, uh, I, I touched on it briefly yesterday um, in my talk on OpenStreetMap Carto, is the, the migration from raster maps over onto uh, the snazzy vector maps instead. Um, there's, a, there's an entire talk possible about this, so I, I'll, I will not go into it in too much detail. Um, but this lets us do more interesting things, more, more options on how many different map layers can we offer as a foundation. Um, what, what other devices can we put um, map layers on? Can we support editing software that wants to display OpenStreetMap without having to ship around um, vast amounts of, of rasters? And this is, a, this is in progress. We've already had some uh, commits to the OpenStreetMap Carto style sheets to prepare um, some of the layer queries for moving over onto, onto vector maps. Happening soon. I would say are things that are about to go. I would like to see them happen in the next six months, but six months, uh, well, timelines are variable, put it that way. I was interested to see who's doing what in OpenStreetMap data around the United Nations. And I thought, this is great. We have a history tab on OpenStreetMap. Many of you will have seen it. Many will have used it. I thought. Let's have a look at the first change set. Power tags were upgraded. OK, sounds interesting. What's going on here? Oh, it's not really round here, is it? Yeah. Anybody who uses the history tab will very quickly end up with this um, <laughs> feeling. But there is a solution. Um, and this is something that has been worked on for many years uh, and is, is in desperate need of people to join in and help. It's called the OpenStreetMap watch list. Instead of looking at each change set and the, the total area that is covered by that change set, instead we divide the world up into many th hundreds of thousands of squares and record for each of those squares things that have happened actually in that square. So that it's not one thing up here, one thing down here, and we claim that everything in the middle is involved in the change set. Um, it's, it was started originally by Matt Amos, but taken over by um, Powell uh, as part of a Google Summer of Code project ported to Rails, um, and we arranged new hardware for it. But we're often shorthanded on these things. So um, it's, it's currently being slowly developed, but hasn't got much impetus behind it. If you wanted to get involved in a project which will instantaneously make the history tab work much better, check this out. Um, and if you're interested, I'd love to talk to you about it. The second thing which I'm going to put in happening soon, and it might make a smile on some people's faces, um, is the discussion of having an area feature type within OpenStreetMap. We have nodes, we have ways, we have relations. And trying to make areas out of nodes, ways, and relations often leads to problems. Often it's bulk imports that are the problem, but I don't want to get onto that topic. Um, the idea is that we will all have an area data type, which will make it easier to detect whether or not this should be handled as a polygon. Um, Jochen gave a, a great talk about it at State of the Map in, in 2013, um, in which he described the five different ways that areas are recorded in OpenStreetMap. Um, for example, coastline files are handled as the water is on the right-hand side, I think. Um, of ways that are otherwise unrelated. We can take away and join up, and that makes an area. If it's a forest, but not if it's a road. Um, but uh, you can't just say, no, a highway tag versus um, the land use tags, because highway equals service in a loop is just a road going in a circle. Highway equals services 
with a plural is an area for, for motorway rest stations. And so all this stuff could be much more simplified if we have an area data type. This is a big challenge um, and needs a lot of people to get involved in it. We need people who are interested in writing editors to support it. We need um, people who are interested in um, the data consumers, whether that's OSMTP GSQL or third party um, data sets. We need somebody uh, who's interested in writing the data storage um, for doing this. It, it's slightly disappointing to me that um, we haven't managed to crack on and, and get this through. Um, previously, when we've made big changes to OpenStreetMap, like adding change sets or even adding relations and dropping segments for the, the people who were, remember those, um, we've managed to crack on, on through it. I'm hoping that uh, we will find some people in this audience who want to get involved. Um, but in saying that, I think it's inevitable, which is why I have it up on the slides is, is happening soon. It is a discussion or it's an idea that nobody has disagreed with, just very few people want to make the first move. Another thing is um, expanding the abilities of um, the OpenStreetMap website. Um, for all the features that we handle at the moment, there's only a fraction of things that we could do in order to support a community with tens of thousands of mappers and, and everything else. We have a concept for creating groups within the website itself. We have our mailing lists, we have our forums, we have all these different places where people can try and get together. But there's no reason that they all have to be separate. And so a, a, a mock-up was made a, f a few years ago of um, could we embed this within um, OpenStreetMap? And the answer, of course, is yes. We even have a... We even have a version running groups.apis.dev.openstreamapp.org. If you go and have a look at it, right now it's there, it works. Not 100%, but it's, it's there and it works. We have a pull request available, and it, um, it needs some help. It needs to finish off a few um, corner cases. We could, uh, we could get groups going on. Again, this is my, I think this is going to happen. I think this is inevitable. Um, we need some help with where it's going. Happening later, I should say, is my, I don't, I don't see it imminent. There's, there's not much code already re ready to go with this. Until now, our view of what it's like to edit OpenStreetMap has mainly been based around the idea of we go out and map, we come back again, we use our computers, and uh, we enter the data, which has worked. But we want to expand the number of editors vastly. And very soon we'll be looking and saying there are more people, or we want more people to edit OpenStreetMap than there are laptop computers in the world. Most people get mobile devices. Most people outside developed Western nations get mobile devices. And this focus on, on using fully featured desktop editors, I think, is, is limited. I think it's, it's, it's not going to be where we are in five years' time. So one in focus is on the mobile editors. We've had some of these before. Sometimes they're very limited, um, just changing opening hours on points of interest. Sometimes they're fully featured, like in the center here we have um, Vespucci. But as uh, I've heard comments from other people saying what these are are just um, trying to cram an editor into a smaller screen rather than what could we do on a mobile device. One of the interesting uh, things I saw yesterday was when uh, Richard Fairhurst was um, demonstrating a, a mobile editor that was entirely voice control based, not even, not even trying to cram user interfaces onto a screen. Um, and so in broad, broad brush strokes, I think the, the future of OpenStreetMap editors is not going to be ID version 2 or Potlatch version 3. It's going to be mobile editing. But not necessarily just fancy mobile editing. I would like to see some really trivial editing as well. Why can't we do this? Why can't I change the name? Why can't I change a tag on the OpenStreetMap website? I'm already logged in. I've already picked the feature. I know what change I might not make this change, because that, that's not quite right. But the principle still stands. 
If any of you have ever made a Rails app, if any of you have ever made a form on a, on a Rails application, you know you could probably knock this out tomorrow and we could deploy it. Anyone up for the challenge? I'll take that as a yes. We've seen this before. I saw this one earlier on. Um, this is what happened to Google MapMaker. Um, they, had, they had some vandalism and everyone went, ah, look, they, their MapMaker didn't work. People managed to vandalize it. You ever think what happens to OpenStreetMap? How many people do we have checking what's going into OpenStreetMap right now? How many, how many places around the world is this happening and we haven't even noticed yet? But it's not just deliberate vandalism. Um, it's, just, it's just simple mistakes. If you look here, there are disconnected roads. On the bottom, you can see this is the United Nations building. And I took this screenshot yesterday morning when I got up. The eyes of the world are on OpenStreetMap this weekend. The eyes of the world are on our map outside the United Nations. And we have a missing road. We have um, traffic lights attached to a park. Thankfully, it's fixed now. I checked this morning just to make sure it was. <laughs> but this is the, the second long-term thing we need to consider. The first long-term thing is how we move away from desktop editing. The second one is how do we do quality assurance better than we do now? As part of this talk, I asked a few people for their input. And this was a common theme. And I got back from people. Uh, who work on this all the time, including members of the data working group, saying, we struggle with our quality assurance tools. We don't have a good change set viewer. There's no, there's no place you can go to say, what did this change set look like before? What does it look like now? What changes were actually made? You end up with a big list of ways and click on each one of them and try and figure out what actually happened. The change set reverter that we have is a little script that about eight people in the world know how it works. Um, <laughs> that's not scalable. If there's an edit war, if somebody starts drawing, let's say, um, Google pissing on OpenStreetMap logos um, all over a particular part of the world, we can't, we can't deal with that. We can't isolate that. We can switch OpenStreetMap off, or we can try and fight the fire, but we don't have the tools to block. We can't block by particular tags. If people are having edit wars around the world over one of our tags, we, we don't have the facility to jump in and say, right, that tag is out of bounds. We don't have any way to review all the change sets in an area to make sure what's going on. There are loads of these quality assurance tools that will help build OpenStreetMap over the next five years. And if you're thinking, I would like a project to work on, think about quality assurance. I'm going to digress slightly. I said at the start there weren't many developers. So who's going to do all this? Um, a couple of years ago, I had an idea to find out who develops OpenStreetMap, or more importantly, to get 100 people a year developing OpenStreetMap, core OpenStreetMap tools. I used a list of um, core software that had come out of the engineering working group. Here's the list of projects. Um, and I was very pleasantly surprised, because I wrote a little script and went through all these projects and said, how many people have, edit how, how many people have contributed to these projects in the last year? And I'll Next year, I'll get that up to 100. And it came out, and it said there were 97 last year. And so I thought, oh, well, job done. <laughs> I don't need to worry anymore. But I dug out this code recently and uh, put some numbers together. So here we have the number of contributors every year for those core projects. Bear in mind that 2015 is only halfway through, so I do expect that to, to probably go up a bit um, at the end. And you can see it's looking good. It's going up. What's more interesting, though, is if you break it down into cohort analysis. So each of these bars are now colored by what year those developers started. Well, what was the first commit amongst any of those projects? And are then tracked as they move around between all the different projects and whether they reappear in the following years. 2006 is like right back when it started. So the four guys who jumped in there, actually most of them stuck around. Um, and we can see things like in yellow, the 2008 cohort kept going. We had a big, big chunk of people. We doubled the amount of developers in OpenStreet, or rather half the developers that um, were active in 2008 were new people, and most of them stuck around for subsequent years. We can see interesting things happen more recently. In 2013, that big green bar at the top, a huge number of people developed an OpenStreetMap for the very first time. 
But look at 2014. Where did they go? What happened to all those developers? We have the same uh, problem so far in, in 2015, where that huge chunk of purple 2014 era developers, they've all gone as well. <laughs> they graduated. So, so some of this is an, an, an anomaly. Um, 2013 was when the ID project was launched onto the main page, and an awful lot of developers were doing um, presets. They were um, suggesting changes for presets within the ID editor. And that's the kind of thing where um, you know, they come in, they make, they make a pull request, and then, then they leave again. But it does concern me hugely that these people got not only interested in OpenStreetMap, not only to the point that they downloaded the software, not only the point that they managed to fix the problem they wanted to do, but made a request, and that re pull request was successful, and we didn't manage to retain them. And we're getting really bad at retaining new developers. This is not a, this is not a good diagram, uh, not a good line. It's not heading in the right direction. At this rate, we might end up with 200, 300 new developers every year. And if we're retaining 5% of them, we're doing something very wrong. I want you guys to think about the possible consequences of what happens if we retain people like that. Who's going to be here still helping Steve out with his uh, grand project in five years' time? So in the dim and distant future, what are we going to be working on? I've given as far as I can imagine um, with specific topics, and that's, a, that's as good as my forward vision can get. What I would say is that I think there's a big theme behind what we're doing. The way things have changed over the last few years and indicates where we'll be going in the future. And this is the idea that um, in all of the different aspects of OpenStreetMap, we are moving from a situation where you, um, you get to edit it or you get to make your change. Don't worry if it breaks everything. We'll fix it later. I don't think that's sustainable. We've moved all of our code out of an SVN repo where everybody had access to do anything they like. And we move all of our code bases are now in a system where people have to request a change, and that change gets reviewed. We can talk about um, installation documentation, for example. That used to be based on the wiki. Um, and anybody could go in and say, uh, no, your instructions are wrong. This is how we fix it. And it turns out most of the time they're not reading the instructions. So all those instructions are now off elsewhere. They're embedded in situations where you have to request a change, and then that change can be applied. And I think this model will apply to increasing numbers of aspects of OpenStreetMap, whether that's documentation or um, even editing OpenStreetMap itself. We'll move to a model where anybody can still edit, everybody can contribute, but we can't um, sustain this uh, situation where everyone breaks it and we have to run around fixing it later on. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Uh, the, the suggestion about re reviewing the actual changes to the map before they go live, I, I, I can understand the motivation behind that, but uh, I have some experience with Wikipedia. Uh, where they have a similar feature, feature called pending changes. Uh, and we've had like very mixed results f for that, which is why it's not enabled in most places. The, the basic issue is that if you have this huge number of new contributors, most of which are, are are in good faith and trying to do a good job, and then the small number of reviewers, you, you get like a, a backlog. So that's the, the biggest issue with like a pre a pre uh, a pre merge workflow like that for the actual map. Code is obviously a different issue. Yeah, thanks. So I'll repeat that comment for the AV system, which is that um, the it's Wikipedia have experience of moving to uh, um, request your edit um, change, but with a large number of people wanting to make changes and a small number of reviewers, you end up with a backlog. I certainly don't think this is an immediate thing that OpenStreetMap would move towards, and there are definitely different approaches that we could have. Even if the reviews are, are time-bound, 
so that there is no backlog. Your review will go live in 15 minutes, and that gives our reviewers 15 minutes to catch the vandalism or the mistakes or whatever else. Um, we would not be able to move to this anytime soon because we don't have any of the tools required in order to review proposed changes. That was part of the earlier discussion. So this is a, this is a very long-term thing, but I don't see it as a sustainable... Um, I, yeah, as I said, I don't see it as sustainable. We have problems with the map outside our conferences. Um, I would like to be able to just catch more of these things before they have uh, an impact on, on other people. But this is, this is like beyond five years in, in my view um, from now. If you have more questions, over here. The microphone button is just right beside the microphone in silver. And then wait for it to turn red. That's it. Yeah. OK. Uh, one question here. Uh, is there any plan to do more um, for the login or register process when somebody just starts being an editor to identify the age, uh, the gender, the region or something? I think that's, that will be a way to also kind of control why people is leaving and when they are not remaining um, more time as editors. So maybe having something like that for the information at the beginning could give us a better overview. Yeah, so the question is, um, is there going to be more data collected about the editors who are, who are signing up in order that we have better information on them? Um, yes, I can see these things being useful. There's a, there's a huge privacy implication, and, and we don't want to discourage people from signing up if they're not happy answering questions. What I would say is that we already collect lots of data about people who use the website. And we do no analysis with it at all. We have a, a, an analytic system, um, and we know who's logged in, how long they're on the website for, um, which pages they go to, has anybody ever used the history tab and enjoyed it, that kind of thing. Um, but actually, we're, we're shorthanded. We don't have people an analyzing any of the data that we have at the moment. So the problem is not, are we collecting data about our users? Are we, it's the fact that we're not making any decisions based on the data we're collecting already. I'll go with Ilya. Ah, okay. So you mentioned quite uh, um, some uh, quite big projects uh, to do in the future. Or do you believe there will appear uh, an unpaid volunteer who, sing who single-handedly finishes one of those projects? Yeah, so the question is, do I believe that there will be uh, volunteers who can single-handedly finish one of these things? No. No, I, d I don't think any of these projects that I've outlined are the remit of one person to work on alone. Um, many of the projects that we have in OpenStreetMap at the moment um, generally have one or two main contributors who do the vast amount of the work. That's, that's normal for open source projects. Um, but I would like to work with the um, developers around OpenStreetMap in order to help different projects get more developers in. I'm very proud of the fact that OpenStreetMap Carto has got four committers and 49 contributors and, and hundreds more who, who work on things. Whereas many of these key things that I'm talking about, it's one guy working on his own and only has three issues um, uh, against his repository. So there's a s second half of that is, is it going to be a volunteer who does it or is it going to be paid developers? Um, Thankfully, it's half past now, so I need to finish before answering that question. All right, thanks very much. Yeah.